I'm so glad you're here today. We really are um, blessed in this church to have all of the generations like richly represented, and it's just great to put them up here on stage. You get to see them a little bit. You know, generational shift is a real thing. We're in the midst of it in our church, in case you didn't know. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But first, as always, the joke. The village blacksmith finally found an apprentice, someone willing to work hard for very little pay and for long hours. The blacksmith immediately began his instructions to the lad. He was being very clear, very specific. Now, when I take the horseshoe out of the fire, I will lay it upon the anvil, and when I nod my head, you hit it with the hammer. You're ahead of me. The apprentice did just as he was told. He's now the village blacksmith. (laughs) These uh, generational handoffs are very important that you do them well with lots of communication. So today I want to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, about the way we move in generations. Uh, Yesterday I had the pleasure, uh, John and my friend Kathy and I, we were in uh, Dallas for my little girl's uh, preschool graduation three hours and 15 minutes of preschool graduation. I think she had four costume changes. Yeah, she, uh, for those of you who don't know, she's not uh, mine biologically or legally, but I'm daddy in her life, and she is mine. It's been so amazing to watch her, her grow and thrive, and she's now stepping into something new in her life. It changes. She's not going to be that baby that she was. She's now ready. She's going to be starting kindergarten in the fall. And those of you who are parents, you've walked through this. You've watched how the kids change and grow. And eventually they begin to take up the responsibilities of their own lives and their communities. And then they're running the world. How do we feel about that? This, this succession of generation, generations over the centuries, that's how it's done. That is the model. We have to do it well. One of the things I've noticed is that um, the late teens, young adults, it becomes a period of great differentiation. And suddenly, um, the teens particularly have to let us know that they're not us. You know, they find their own slang. They find their own music that we know nothing about. They, you know, the, the, have you heard of a, um, dubstep? Listen to it and you'll see what I mean. We know nothing about what it is. And that's natural because every generation has to find a space. There comes a point when they're just beginning to venture into adulthood and it looks like all the space is already taken because all the adults are where they're supposed to be and the, the young ones are going, well, what about me? Where do I get to stand so they have something to say, something to give, something to contribute to the world? And that's what we have to become aware of. And then our older generation, do I still have something to contribute? Do I still have a space in this world? And so we have to look at, are we making room for people? Every generation brings its own sensibility, its own perspective, its own triumphs, its own tragedies, and its own challenges that are left to them by the previous generation. I'm so sorry, you guys, really. I don't know. We... We have left you some interesting things that you're going to have to handle. You ready for that, Dom? Yeah, okay. (laughs) And that's the way it works. In Spiral Dynamics, which our own Cindy Wigglesworth has taught here on several occasions, it's a a way of understanding, it's a lens through seeing, um, through which we can see human evolution and consciousness. And what Don Beck, the creator of that work, has said is that each problem calls into its into being its own solution every problem is the architect of its answer and so then out of the problem something new is created which then becomes the problem and then calls in the situa- the solution and that becomes the next problem and it sounds it could sound futile it could sound frustrating but what it really is that is the engine of evolution Hegel described it as thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that there is a way that that time moves forward bringing new understanding and new ways of being by simply being with what is. And there are things that demand our attention. Problems occur. How do we bring our unique insights and perceptions and skills and resources to bear? And we have to make room for everybody 
to be able to participate in that, in that journey, in that, um, the journey of evolution, really. That's what it is. And not only is it um, within the generations, there's another, um, Cindy just taught a beautiful class on uh, Jonathan Haidt's book, uh, Conscious, Righteous Mind, and he talked about that there are some people that seem to be wired for newness, and some people seem to be uh, phobic <laughs> of the new, really maybe favoring stability more. And what I, as I was thinking about preparing what I wanted to share with you today, this, it seems to me we need both. That systems have to evolve with time. You don't, you know, the buggy whip company, they're not doing so well these days. You have to adapt, and we have to be willing to see what's needed now. And so there is this idea that um, too much change and the system will perish, not enough change and the system will perish. How do we find the balance the, the, of that polarity of working with what is and what works and what's good and still evolving and adapting to what's here now? In case you didn't notice, we are in the midst of a general, generational shift here at Unity. Reverend Howard Caesar is stepping down in September from pulpit ministry after 34 years. Isn't that amazing? 34 years in this community. Do you have any idea what the average tenure of a senior minister in a church in America is? Just guess. Eight, five, 12, three to four years. Do you get the blessing that we've been given with Reverend Howard here? He and Diane have given 34 years of their gifts, their insight, their work, their blood, sweat, and tears for the stability and the growth and the evolution of this church. Powerful. And as we're stepping into um, a new chapter, it's going to take all of us. And there are two questions. I'm going, to, I'm going to be asking you to think about this a lot over the next year. Two questions I want everyone who has any investment in Unity of Houston to take up. First is, what is essential? What is it about this church that if we didn't have that, it wouldn't even be unity for you? I want you to spend some time on that in meditation and prayer. What is essential to you about this church that we cannot change, that we must preserve, that no matter what the next iteration, no matter what the next stages of evolution we as a spiritual community take, we have to be this to you. And then the second question is this. What's needed now? What's needed now? What's the thing that it's being called for and you can feel it in your heart, you can see it in our culture, something new is needed. Thank you, Najla, for that beautiful meditation. Do you notice how few people we have her age up on this stage? Do you notice how few people we have her age in the church? Something is needed. I don't know, um, this is not meant to be a downer, but you may or may not be aware, but uh, the trends in the church business are not that great right now. <laughs> After World War II, they began tracking this. And in Europe, church attendance just plummeted in Europe. No one goes to church in Europe. Very, very few people. Churches are even, in some countries, they're just state subsidized just to keep the culture going. But they're not an active part of the life of community in most countries in Europe. And up until recently, America had bucked the trend. Church was still a vital part of how we operated. Do you know that they now have soccer games on Sunday mornings for the kids? Did you know that? Yeah, it's changed. In the most recent polling, the fastest growing group of people with their spiritual um, affinity or affiliation are the nuns. And I don't mean the Catholic nuns. I mean the N-O-N-E-S, when they check none of the above. Are we still going to be vital as a community? Is our teaching still going to be applicable to the next generation? What can we do to open the door a little wider to give this teaching to those who are ready for it now? So those are the kind of questions that I'm going to ask you to, to really be with. And again, I'll just repeat them. I want you to think about what is essential for you in unity and what is needed now for you. Because each of us is a unique perspective on God. Each of us is a unique um, expression. We are here to express and experience God in a way that only we can. 
and that there's something, some kind of seeing and some sort of the flavor of the, the givingness of God that comes through you and it doesn't happen any other way. I love the Emerson quote. You hear me say it a lot. But the fact that I am here shows me that the soul had need of an organ. Shall I not assume the post? Rumi says it this way. It's as if we were sent here from a far off kingdom with but one task. And if we accomplish this task, everything else that we do or do not do will not matter. If we do not accomplish this task, everything else that we do or do not do, will not matter. What is this task? It is the discovery and the delivery of the authentic self. And so as we step into the next chapter of Unity of Houston in the next years, are you going to give your gift to us? Are you going to share with us what you're seeing? My, my email is in the, the bulletin. And I've already created two folders on my email for you to share with me what it is, the answers to those questions. What's essential and what's needed now? I want you to really help me with this because the truth is we are currently um, living out the vision of Unity of Houston, but it's not Howard Caesar's vision. He's our guide. He's our leader, but it's you. It's the people who are invested that are bringing the vision, and it's going to be the same going forward. It's not Michael Gott's vision. I might call Keith and harass him sometimes, but it's really, it's not my vision that's going to move us forward. It's the vision that is bigger than any of us, but we all have a part of it. We all have ownership in it. We all, one of the things that I love about this particular service is that we clear out the podium, and we give other people a chance to come up and give their gift. That thrills me. Years ago, I discovered this. I've been a performer for 30 years, but if I can help somebody else get their standing ovation, it makes me just as happy as getting my own. And I love being able to find young talent and encourage them to find people who have a calling to give their gift and give them space and support and those necessary tools so that they can give their gift for their generation. We're almost done. It's going to be a short one today. You're going to like this. Jesus said this in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The first century Christians were known by their love one for another. Persecuted by Rome, cast out by the Jewish hierarchy, they, they sold their belongings to live in community. The parents parented each other's children. They cared for each other. Women held places of honor and authority in the early church. There was such a sense of like, we are doing this together. And I don't know if you know this, but the 12 steps were um, partly informed in their conception by something called the Oxford Group, which in the 1920s and 30s were seeking to live as a first century Christian would have lived with rigorous honesty and with accountability for each other. And you can't have accountability without great trust. And that is what I believe that we are called to as well. Again, it's not my vision, it's not Howard's vision, it is the vision, God's vision of who we are to be and what is calling us forward. Proverbs 29, 18 says that without a vision, the people perish. Mary Oliver is one of my favorite poets. Just take a breath and just feel this. Poetry is more about the feeling than it is about the information conveyed. I invite you to feel this with your heart. You do not have to be good you do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. And meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are headed home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, this world offers itself to your imagination. 
calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Love is calling to us. From heart to heart, from generation to generation, it is love that will lead us forward. We've been joking about it for the last three or four months that um, we're getting a reputation around town as being that love everybody church. My hope is that's exactly who we're known as. As a community of great inclusion. As a community that lifts people up and equips them to give their gift in the world. A community that calls our young people into leadership to lead us forward. Something wonderful wants to be happening through you, through me, through us all. Love is calling. Will you answer to be a part of this wonderful community? I love you. God bless you.